Hey everyone, Ranger William here from the Overmount Victory National Historic Trail. I want to thank you for watching this part one of our three-part series that hated Scotsman, Patrick Ferguson as a soldier, officer, and leader in the American Revolution. Now the reason I wanted to bring you this topic, bring you this program, is to give a different, kind of deeper look at who Patrick Ferguson was. And if you're familiar with the story of the Overmountain Victory Trail, this is the British officer who is being pursued. This is the man who is kind of uh, famous or infamous for threatening the Overmountain settlements, for raising an army of loyalist militia, and for being pursued by the Overmountain men, by other patriots, until he was caught and killed at the Battle of Kings Mountain on October 7th, 1780. Now, if you go and visit the battlefield and his grave at Kings Mountain National Military Park, um, one of the markers really stands out to me. As you're on the ridge, um, walking down the trail, and before you reach uh, Ferguson's grave, you know, the, amongst the many other interpretive signs and memorials to Patriot officers, you'll notice a stone column. It's a, it's a simple, flat top stone pillar, almost about three, four feet high, and chiseled on top of that flat surface is the date of the battle, and then just three words. Here, Ferguson fell. Now those three words, as simple as they are, they marked the end of British control of the Western Carolinas, at least the beginning of the end. These th three short words, they marked um, panic and fear in loyalists in the Carolinas who had placed their hopes of not only victory in the war, but personal safety, placed these hopes in Major Patrick Ferguson. Now, for the past almost two and a half centuries, um, stories have been told about this infamous figure, the, that hated Scotsman, this British officer who brings threats of destruction, raising an army of our nation's enemies, um, remembers him as this one of the most infamous Scotsmen in American history. But to kind of really understand the impact of these three words, to understand why his death at Kings Mountain meant so much to so many people, we need to understand Patrick Ferguson. This man was a British officer who's unlike any other in the Southern campaign of the American Revolution. Um, he was younger than the commanding officers, but he was roughly about 10 years older than many of his peers, men like Bannister Tarleton and uh, Lord Francis Rodden. Um, and behind Ferguson, looking at his career, was a train of kind of unorthodox, out of the box kind of ideas, which some succeeded and some did not. Uh, but the stories that we tell about people, about events, it shapes how we view those events, how future generations remember them. So rather than that usual story about this villainous, infamous figure, let's tell a different story about Patrick Ferguson. Now to start out, let's look at his early life. Uh, Patrick Ferguson is uh, born in Edinburgh, Scotland in June, June 4th of 1744. Um, and when he's born, you look at kind of think, what, what does Edinburgh mean? What's happening there at this time? Edinburgh is the heart, one of the main cities of the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, that means you have this huge push for education. You have these Enlightenment thinkers, writers, people like... Um, Robert Burns, uh, people like uh, David Hume, Adam Smith. Um, this is going to be kind of that circle that you see Ferguson's parents running in. Now, his mother and father on um, both sides of the family are um, Scottish nobility. Uh, his father is actually the Laird of Pitfurr Estate, um, way on the northwestern part of Scotland, even though Edinburgh is down on the kind of the, the southeast coast. Um, and it's in, the, in this almost like a medieval style city. You'll notice the name at the top of the slide there, Old Reeky, one of the nicknames for the city, and that is referring to the smell. Uh, very kind of crowded living conditions, very tall towering buildings, like you see over in that, um, that picture there on the, uh, on the side of the screen. Um, some homes refer to as being 10, 12 stories tall. In fact, the Ferguson family home, family home at uh, 333 High Street was, I believe it was seven stories, um, with the first three or four levels being uh, Patrick's father's offices then the family living above that. Um, now, so while his father was, um, I'm sorry, the uh, second Laird of Pitfur Estate, 
Um, his mother was the daughter of fourth Lord Elibank. Um, and she's also the sister of a decorated British Army officer, uh, who a major in the British Army. So you have kind of a, a pretty good pedigree on both sides of the family, and they're running in these Enlightenment circles. They're looking at debate societies, asking some hard questions, getting into some deep topics, and they stayed in communication with other Enlightenment thinkers all over the Atlantic world, at least the British Atlantic world. Um, so some historians have even said that when you're looking at this idea of these Enlightenment thinkers and debaters, these discussions, uh, Edinburgh is ranking third only behind London and Paris as far as education goes. Um, so a very interesting world where Ferguson is born. Now, it is also a time of turmoil. Uh, those familiar with Scottish history are going to note his birth date, 1744. This is just a couple, this is just about a year before you have... Um, the Great Rising, the 45 Rebellion, the Jacobite Rebellion, uh, where Bonnie Prince Charlie, the uh, heir to the Stuart throne, the Stuart line of British kings, is going to return from exile, his family's exile, raise a band of Scottish followers, um, funded and armed by the French a little bit, and they're going to try and overthrow the Hanoverian monarchs, the King Georges. Now, this is going to really come home for Patrick in uh, September of 45. This is going to be when uh, uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie and his army actually capture Edinburgh. They, they seize the city. So Patrick is just over a year old at that time. Now, his father was kind of unusual. His father is actually an Anglican, uh, so not, not too common. And uh, his mo uh, Patrick's mother's father, his maternal grandfather, um, after the rebellion is put down at the defeat of the Battle of Culloden, um, his grandfather is actually going to be accused of being a Jacobite supporter. Um, and But Patrick's father, being involved in the law, is actually going to um, defend many uh, suspected, many accused Jacobites in courts of inquiry. So it's this very interesting environment of the Enlightenment thinkers asking hard questions, um, and even if you know, you are seeing family divided on both sides, giving everyone a fair chance. It's a very interesting world, outside the box, hard asking questions, uh, but not afraid not afraid to challenge established ideas and figures. So that's going to be Patrick's childhood. Now, at 1756, um, that year, at the age of 12, you see Patrick decide to set off into his career. Um, he is not the firstborn son. He's actually the second son. So if you're wanting kind of adventure, the chance of advancement, the chance of inheritance, um, that's kind of gone. The inheritance will go to the eldest. So Patrick is wanting to join the military. And at the age of 12, in 1756, he applies for a commission with his uncle James Murray's regiment, uh, his mother's brother, the 15th Regiment of Foot. But you're looking at 1756, Britain and France are just entering the uh, Seven Years War, the French and Indian War. Um, so his uncle refuses, saying, you know, this is no place for 12-year-old Patrick right now, not a good time. So rather than go into the field, he goes to the Woolwich Military Academy in London. Now it's here that Patrick is going to study some of the most difficult, most mathematical elements of the army, and that is engineering and artillery. All about angles, degrees, science, mathematics, and he excels very well at these fields, um, even though he notes that he does not care much for London. He notes that in some of his writings back to his family. Now, in 1759, at the age of 15, Patrick finally gets his wish. He gets a commission in the Royal North British Dragoons. Um, that's kind of the regiment that you see pictured over there on the uh, on the side of the screen. These guys who are mounted on horseback with swords, so they're fighting on from the saddle. But also he has a, a musket hanging there from a strap around him. Um, so this is going to be allowing them to fight dismounted on foot as well as mounted on horseback. Kind of scouts the eyes and ears of the army. Um, this regiment is actually going to go on to be made famous as the Scots Greys, the Scott Grey Dragoons. And they're going to serve all throughout the, the, uh, the revolution, throughout the... Um, the, the time of the revolution, and they're going to serve kind of famously in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, so they're not known as the Scots Greys yet, uh, just the Royal North British Dragoons for now, uh, but they're serving in the Netherlands, in Germany, fighting against France and her allies. Now when he joins this service, his mother is going to worry very much about him. She writes to her brother, the, uh, the military officer, and worries about what she calls her slight and fragile boy. Now her uncle replies back to her saying that she has to stop worrying. She can't 
can't worry about him now. He, she cannot think of Patrick as her son, but he is now a son of Mars. It's where we get the title. This is a reference to the, uh, Mars, the Roman god of war, and Patrick is now a son of Mars, a soldier in the British army. Now, we're not sure if Patrick is going to arrive in uh, with his regiment in time to see action at the Battle of Minden on August 1st, 1759. That large battle you see in the background up here, the, uh, the lines of troops and clouds of smoke. But we know, do know that he is going to see action at the Battle of Zyrenburg with his regiment. Some numerous other battles with constant clashing, skirmishing, patrolling. Again, these dragoons are going to be the eyes and ears of the army, and both sides use this kind of tactic. So these cavalry, these mounted patrols are going to be uh, uh, clashing quite often. One kind of famous story that we have is when Patrick is kind of falling back from a superior French force, he drops his pistol. And rather than leaving it behind, rather than panicking, he simply turns his horse back, coolly rides under fire, swoops out of the saddle, grabs up his pistol, and returns to his regiment. Now, it's not going to be long in the field, however, that 1760 or 61, sometime there, Patrick is going to catch tuberculosis. Um, now, in looking at 1760 uh, and 61, you're looking at before a lot of modern medicine, before you have antibiotics, that infection is going to spread to the synovial fluid, um, especially in Patrick's knee, that fluid that kind of is a part of your joints. Um, now, this infection, this synovial tuberculosis, is going to cause joint swelling. It's going to cause pain, fatigue, um, and if it goes untreated, it can actually damage the bone tissue there in the joint. It's going to limit your range of motion. So you really can't uh, be a very good cavalryman, a very good soldier with this much pain, fatigue, limited motion. And in fact, this is not limited just to the 18th century. Uh, this, this disease can still happen today, this kind of infection. Um, it often gets, often gets uh, kind of misdiagnosed as a bacterial infection rather than as synovial tuberculosis. Um, so it's not one of those that has gone uh, has gone away. Uh, but now here he is, 17 years old. He's been in the field. He's fighting the French. He's seen all kinds of combat. He's learning the value of these kind of unconventional kind of troops. They can be mounted. They can be dismounted. They can fight on foot, on the saddle. Doesn't matter. They're useful. And he sees that use. He's part of that use. But now, thanks to tuberculosis, he's got to head home. Um, what you see him return to in 1762, he's going to head back to Edinburgh. He's going to try and recover there, but he's going to write to his family, and he's going to note that this is not exactly the best, most restful place for him. Uh, he says, quote, When I recollected my motives for leaving Edinburgh, I thought I had fallen out of the frying pan and into the fire, every night drinking till two next morning and then sleeping till two in the afternoon. Rather, as post there, I chose to post at Pitfer, where I hope my bones, flesh I have none, will rest in peace, end quote. So what he's talking about here is when he goes back to Edinburgh to rest, he's just part of this huge social scene. They're out, um, we would call it partying. He is out uh, staying up far too late. Um, and it's not exactly all kind of debauchery, but he joins what he calls the poker club. You think, okay, maybe it's a gentleman's gaming club, but it's actually a front for a political society. Um, these guys are going to be a, one of those kind of enlightenment things. They're going to be debating philosophy, laws, um, and especially becoming known for promoting militia service as an embodiment of individual liberty and identity. But in Scotland, in the 1760s, this kind of uh, every man armed is going to be banned under British law. You're looking at one of those um, one of those strictures, one of those kind of a punishment because of the Jacobite rebellion. So the poker club is going to be attacking this, saying it is not only our identity as Scotsmen that is being offended, but our, our identity as humans. Uh, we need the right to defend ourselves as in, in forming militia. Um, so Patrick is going to actually write several satirical articles in the Royal Gazette attacking this law, advocating for its repeal, advocating for Scottish militia, but he can't use his name. He's a commissioned British officer. He cannot very well be writing these articles attacking uh, parliamentary law. So he's going to have to use uh, pseudonyms. So we have listed over there on the side some of the, uh, the pen names he was known to use. Eggshell, Memento Mori, and John Bull. 
Now, the main kind of x-ray up here uh, on the screen, this is going to be an x-ray of what that synovial tuberculosis looks like, what he's dealing with during this recovery, during these debate societies. You notice the white arrows pointing to that kind of cloudier area behind the knee joint. That's going to be where that infection is really swelling, causing that pain, that limited motion, and the yellow arrow pointing to, the, pointing to some of that uh, bone deterioration from that damage, from that, that, uh, that infection. Um, but by 1763 in August, he's well enough to rejoin his regiment. Um, this, the tuberculosis has gone down. The swelling has gone down. Uh, it will flare up later on in his life, but he can now rejoin the field, but the war has ended. There is now peace with France. He rejoins his regiment on a, a small town of Kelso on the Scottish border. What you see happening with the British Army, now that the war is done, they're going to take their regiments and scatter them across Britain, kind of like police forces. You have a small little picture over there on the, uh, on the side. Um, it's going to be one of these British garrisons where you have these troops stationed. And uh, he's serving there in Kelso, but the poor weather, the, the damp climate, 1764, he has another flare-up of the tuberculosis, again having to go home to recover. Uh, later that year, he can bring come back into service again, regiment no longer in Kelso, but now in Manchester. Um, in the north of England, a, uh, an industrial town, a kind of an up-and-coming city where you have uh, kind of the industrial revolution really starting to boom in some of these communities. Um, and Patrick knows he doesn't care for it. Um, not so, I mean, he doesn't care for the, uh, the kind of the quiet police service, but he also doesn't care for the people very well. He says, quote, in one letter to his family, there is not one man who has the spirit of a gentleman and their women deal eternally in scandal and live by defamation. Uh, so not a lot of high opinion of these, what he calls the nouveau riche, these up and comers, new money um, that you see in these industrial towns. Now in 1766, he's finally had it. He doesn't want to be this police service anymore. He doesn't care for it. He takes a year off to travel Europe. He wants to uh, see the world. He wants adventure. He's getting bored. He says in a letter back to his family, quote, nothing but the terrors of hanging or the bodily danger of 50 cannon shot a day will rouse me from this long lethargy with which I've been overwhelmed these three years. I wish, therefore, it would please his majesty either to allow me money to hire a nurse to keep me constantly asleep or hang me or send me abroad. So there you have Patrick just laying it out on the line there. He wants adventure. He wants travel. He wants action. He wants danger. And this is not fulfilling that. This police service being posted in Kelso and Manchester, it's just dragging on for him. And he either wants to be kept asleep, uh, executed, or sent into the field. He wants to see adventure. He wants to see the empire. So that's where we're going to leave off here on episode one of the uh, this hated Scotsman, that hated Scotsman. And we are going to catch up with Ferguson in episode two when he gets his wish and he gets sent to the British Empire. So thank you for joining me. Again, this is Ranger William with the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for next time.